everyone. My name is Mayur Zado. Really excited to be here at Selenium Con. So before I start, I want to know how many of you who haven't worked with Clojure or any Lisp languages? OK. I got a lot of people who don't know about Clojure. So let's learn some new thing today. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about how we write functional and integration tests uh, for mobile and web apps using Clojure. Right? But before that, first things first, what is Clojure? So Clojure is invented in 2007 by Rich Hickey. So it is a dynamic functional programming language. And it's a Clojure is a Lisp for JVM, we can say that. Right? So Clojure is actually are two things. One, the language which has a Lisp dialect with a functional emphasis and the great support for concurrency and asynchronous programming. And second, so the compiler which takes code written in a, a Clojure and con compiles it to a Java virtual machine bytecode, right? So Clojure emphasizes simplicity uh, where you can have uh, opt-in functionality like using libraries rather than having a post in structure like having a frameworks, right? So I'll spend most of my time demoing things using Clojure, but to understand that, you must know some basic syntax of Clojure, right? So let's see. Yeah. So every expression written in Clojure is in form of list. And the first item of that list is a function. And everything else is passed as arguments to, to that function, right? Clear enough, right? Yeah. So Clojure is dynamic. It means that Clojure programs are not just something with which you compile and run, but something uh, you can, with which you can interact. So this is where REPL comes into picture. So REPL stands for Read, Eval, Print, Loop. So basically, uh, what it does, uh, it presents you with a prompt. Uh, you, you write code into it. It reads the input, evaluates it, prints the result, and loops presenting you with the prompt again. Right? So, uh, so REPL is the best thing that I've seen while learning any programming language. Like I can show you how you how we develop some things in REPL. So if I want to add uh, arbitrary number of numbers, so what I'll just do is it visible, everyone? Okay. So I'll just say one, two, three, four, five. So it gives me addition. And if I want to do something, uh, if I want to add numbers of uh, a array of numbers, so I'll apply plus or array, right? So using REPL, you can uh, learn and build closure programs instantly, right? So closure is functional programming language. So closure provides functions as a first class object, right? So the philosophy behind closure is that most parts of the program should be functional and that programs which are more functional are more robust, right? So in Clojure, fn creates a function object. It's like an anonymous function, which yields any value like any other. So you can store it in a var, pass to other functions, right? And the defn, it is a macro which helps you write, writing a function a little simpler. And so let's see one example uh, where I will write one function which shows the example of function as a first class object. So here is my basic use case. I want to do x mod y, right? Now I modified my use case. Now I want x plus z and then mod y, right? But I want to add a functionality to my function that I want to take any operator, x of z, so it will be like plus minus multiplication divide. And the final use case is I want output in integer format. So you might have, you might want to convert that format uh, or output to a string. So right now I just want it an integer. Right? So let's see how can I do that in closure. So I have this fancy mod function. Okay. So what it does, it takes in three arguments. First, operator function that is plus minus multiply or divide. And second argument is number to mod y. And third argument is output function. That is, for now, it's integer. I want output in integer, right? So let's see some code. Yeah. So what it does, it returns another function. So 
which takes in two integer arguments, right? So before I'm returning that anonymous function, I'm just doing a pre-checking where operator function should be plus, minus, which belongs to that set. And number to mod by should be integer. And output function should be in an integer form, right? So let, so let's look, how can I do that? So I want to perform addition, and I want to do that uh, mod by three. And I, the output should be an integer form, right? So let's try. Yeah. So you may not understand this code, but you can imagine the same thing in your own preferable language. So you will see the difference, right? So this fancy mod function return one anonymous function, which I'm holding in a, another def, that is var. So mod by three int, uh, it's a var. So I'll just do mod, I'll call that, and I'll pass, suppose, 11 and 11. So it will add those two numbers, and then mod by three, the result is one, right? So now, suppose I want to add functionality where I just want to convert that mod output to string. So what I'll do, just I'll add str in output function, and I'll just save it and compile it. Now if I say I want output as string, and do that thing again, so it will return me a string. So you see, I just modified the, I just changed the some, uh, I, I modified code, and the changes get reflected in Ripple immediately, right? So feedback loop is fast in closure. So this is how we do iterative uh, development in closure. So Clojure is designed to be a hosted language. So Clojure gives an a clean, simple, direct access to a Clo Java APIs. You can call in any Java API directly. So Clojure is actually a great Java library consumer uh, with dot target member notation, right? So this is a syntax of Java interop where you can have a dot, then class name or instance, then member of that class and its arguments. Or in AWS Clojure, you can say dot immediate member of that class, then class name, and its arguments. So let's try with this with example. Yeah. So I'll say dot space, then class name. Suppose my class is string, and its member is suppose length. So it will give me five, right? Now if I say dot, and then immediate member of the string class, that is suppose two uppercase, and then class, which is again string, is my, yeah. right? So let's try something. Uh, so let's call some Java API of Selenium. So you can call any Java API, so you can call that using closure, right? So I'll, I have one function written, which is, which will just do. So what it will do, it will launch a Firefox driver, and it will go to our Helpship support page. It will click on Contact Us button and then it will click on submit and quit the browser. I think internet is slow here. So, so how I did it, I just created an instance of Firefox driver. That's, and how you do it in uh, Java, I uh, use that driver to find an element and then perform an act action on that element. And yeah, it's loading up. <laughs> yeah, so it will click on contact us and click on Submit, done. So if you want to see the code, so I just called, yeah. So new instance, driver of Firefox, then I, I uh, navigate. So I'm exhibiting the body using that driver instance, right? So every time if uh, you are not returning anything, uh, it's in closure, it just return any. If you are ret returning any data structure, it will just return into here. Otherwise, it just return nil. It's kind of uh, what you do, do in a C, like return zero or at the end, right? Something like that. It will, it will give me an error. It will give me an exception, right? Yeah. Sorry. So let's move to macros. So uh, Clojure is a member of uh, Lisp family of language, right? 
So most of the features of Lisp have made it into other languages. But the Lisp approach to macro system set it apart. So macros gives a closure a great power. So using macros, you can modify closure in a way that, that are impossible using any other languages. So the key difference between the function and macros is that so function arguments are evaluated before they are passed to uh, passed to the function. But in macros, they are uh, the macros receive argument as unevaluated data structures. So let's write some control for macro. So some languages provide a feature of unless, which is just opposite of if, right? So what it does, it performs a test, and then executes a body if that test is logically false, right? But closure doesn't have this functionality. So yeah, I can write that. So let's try writing that uh, unless feature using function because if you can't do that using function, don't write macros. <laughs> yeah, because macros are complex and they require you to think carefully about the interplay of macro expansion time and compile time. So let's try this using a function. Yeah. So this is a function, but uh, here's a if syntax enclosure which uh, takes except, uh, expression and if it, that expression is true then it executes a first form otherwise it executes a second form so in unless uh, i just do, i just did uh, opposite of that if so i added if expression if expression is true i'll return a nil otherwise i'll execute the form right so let's try the unless function Sorry. Yeah. So I'm passing an expression false, so it should print the statement, right? Yeah, it's printing it. But what if I now pass true? Now this should not print, right? But it's still printing it. Because I already said that function arguments are evaluated before they are passed to the functions, right? So let's try this using macro. So I have written one macro. So what this macro does is it's a list function returns a list given a items. So here are the my items in list. So I added a quote before if because quote protects it from being evaluated, right? So if I use this as for my true expression case, so it should work. So this should not print now, right? Or if I, if you want to uh, see, or if you want to expand the macro, you can just say. So list returns this function, uh, the list which has if then expression and return nil if that expression is true. Otherwise, return or execute the form, right? Finally, Selenium. So, CLJ WebDriver is a library, closure library basically, which uh, which is used for driving a web browser using Selenium WebDriver as a backend, right? So, so it it uh, built on top of uh, the version of Selenium that is 2.31, but we modified this library for work with the latest version of Selenium that is 2.42 maybe. So that can be found under the closures, right? So let's see how it works in closure. Now if I want to do, I have one, uh, so what we do uh, normally when we write tests in Selenium, you do, you launch a browser, you inspect an element where you want to perform an op operation on that element, right? So what you do, you just find a CSS selector for that element. But still you don't, you are not confident enough to perform any action because you are not sure about that. So how can we check such things? So I have one function which, so it will launch a browser. What it will do, it will just open a browser, it will go to a support page, and I want to click on a contact us button. But I'm not sure it's that the same selector that I'm using. So I'll just do a flash. So it will flash that uh, in the browser. So I'm, okay, that's my selector. So it's not loading, instead of that, I'll just show you, show you on video. 
So it's performing a, or creating a web issue and it, it is flashing everything before performing any action in closure. So it's navigating to a help ship support page. Yeah. It will click on contact us, then fill the form and then click on submit. Right. So with user is back actually a macro which hold, which launches the browser and holds the instance of driver. Right. So every time I don't need to play with that instance. So this is the beauty of Silja web driver because I don't need to play around the driver instance every time when I want to perform any operation on elements. I don't even need to uh, tell that driver that find this element by class name or find this element by ID. I just need to remember a convention that is get, uh, so if I want to get an element by ID, I'll just say element, then I'll add a hash before that ID name. Or if I want to just get element by class name, I'll just put dot before that I, uh, class name, right? So this is how we do it in CLJ web driver. So when you write a uh, Selenium test or any test, so basically we write independent functions, right? And all these independent functions, we call them in a single test. And all these functions are single test cases we can consider, right? And if one function breaks, it breaks whole test. But we don't want that because uh, if I suppose consider an example where I'm creating an issue and then it checks whether I got the email of that issue and then I'm rejecting that issue. So if I don't get email, so check email function fails, but I don't want to fail the uh, next f uh, function that is uh, reject issue because it should not affect. So to handle this case, we, what we do, we add try catch exceptions in each function because each function has a different exception, right? So, so it's like I'm complexing the things. I mean, I'm repeating stuff. I'm adding try catch in every time because my defend function doesn't provide this facility. So, how can I do that? Because every language provides some way to encapsulate pattern, right? But without macros, you, you can't, I mean, the mechanism is incomplete. And you, you most of the time you sense this uh, incompleteness when you say, uh, my life would be easier if uh, only my language had feature X. But in closure, you just implement feature X using macros. So we have written one fa uh, macro which takes a function and which if you, if that function has an, uh, exception, it logs that exception and takes screenshot of current browser. So you will get to know, okay, this fills my case and you will get to know, you just, you just don't have to look for that exception, the whole exception thing. You can just look at its uh, screenshot and get it done, right? So, So we have written a macro in defend with log, which takes a function, doc, its doc string, its argument and its body. So what it will do, it will execute the function, it will log everything. And then if that gives an error, it takes, it waits, waits for two seconds and then it takes a screenshot and it stores it in a, uh, in a, dra a directory, wherever you want, right? So I know this contact of function will work every time, but I, I don't know when design team changes the CSS selector and it will fail. So at that time I just run this and it gives an exception. It should not break whole thing. It will just say, yeah, okay, I, I got it. I logged it and I taken a screenshot of it, right? So that's the easy thing to do in it. Yeah. Yeah, so Calabash CLG, it's a Android automation library and closure uh, using Calabash JVM. So Kapil Reddy from Hellshift who wrote this library. And we've been using this library since last two eight or eight to 10 months. And we've added a lot of features to make it work very efficiently. So I'll show you one demo. So working, so it, sorry. Yeah. So I've written one function, Android demo. So I have one device connected with me. So it's a real device connected. I'm running on, and it's a mirror image of that device. Okay. So when I run, I, it will just launch an app 
it will click on support page, it will click on a section and it will open an FAQ. Yeah, done. Now I have to do some interactive development or for this Android automation. So what I want to do is, I don't want to launch it again. I just want to perform some operation from here. I want to go get back to a previous activity. So how can I do that? So with Android, continue. So this is again another macro which executes a body against the current state of the Android app, right? So I'll just say Android, sorry, Android command and go back. Now I want to inspect elements of this activity because I want to perform some operation. I want to click on this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a macro. Yeah, it's a macro. So I want to inspect elements and I want to click on that contact us button. So I'll just say, but before that I'll, I'll, I want to know the description of each element. So what I can do, I'll say query query the elements of the current activity. So it will give me a description of each and every element. Now I want to click on that contact us button. So I'll say click. Yeah. I want to click on this ID. I'll select, sorry. I'll just click on this. So it's look easy while de doing an iterative development, right? Yeah. So happy to tell you that I wrote this library, so it is used for iOS automations, and it's just a wrapper around Appium Java client. So it, it is capable of doing everything that Appium Java client can do, right? So I have demo to show for this. So what it will do, it will click on contact us button and fill the form and then report an issue. And this is also a real device, it's not a simulator. So I forgot to mention the features of Calabash CLJ for Android. So in Calabash, uh, we have added one feature when you run an automation against Android app. So sometimes it get, it crashes your app and you have to get error logs for getting those exceptions because you don't, you have, you have to know the cause of that crash log, right? <coughs> So uh, we added one feature where you say, this is my app name, these are my tags, and this is type of my log, like error log or debug log. And it will just give you a log, it will capture a log, everything, it will just save in a file and you can, after that, after finishing your automation, you can just take a look at your logs, if, if, if it fr crashes, <coughs> right? So right now, uh, it's built on top of Robotium. And it's not that fast, you know, and we know there is one library, Espresso by Google, which is quite fast enough. So we are, uh, the next step will be like integrating that server into Calabash. And also we are going to support Gradle for this because right now it's, it builds the app using AND. So, yeah. Okay. So I showed you uh, each individual library that is for Selenium, then Calabash, and then IPM. Now I want to do some integrated development, like I want to perform some operation on Android app, then I, the changes will get reflected to a web app, then I'll perform some operation on web app and it will get reflected to an and, and device. So you need to understand the use case. So for this, I'll explain you on a HelpShift product. So HelpShift is an in-app customer support platform 
which enables uh, which enables mobile apps to improve their customer experience. So as HelpShift is built into your app, you, it is easy to communicate with your customer. And we have this real-time dashboard where you can manage a large volumes of uh, conversations efficiently. So for this demo, what I'll do, I'll just say, report an issue from Android, Android device, <coughs> and it will increment, yeah, and it will increment the dashboard count of issue submission. So for this, first I'll launch browser. I'll go, I'll go, go to dashboard, and I'll take uh, initial count of issue submission. Then I'll file the issue from Android. And I'll check whether it count uh, get incremented or not. So initial count is 96. Right? Now it will launch browser, oh, sorry, Android app. It will fill a form. Yeah. At the end, it will reject the issue because every test should be item put in, right? So it will go. It will go to issues list. It will match conversation title in issues list. It will click on that issue and it will get a issue details page, and there it will click reject on for that issue. Yeah. Yes. So it's rejected issue. So as you can see, it it ran one test. Yeah, it ran one test and passed four assertions. So that's it for today. I'm open for questions. I don't think uh, we are running out of time, right? Yeah. So I'll take questions offline if you have any. Yeah.